Occasionally, you find Hobblecronus or Hobblecronides palexes. There's another app that found this particular chronoid. But in recent years, we've even found several specimens of the Edrioasteroid, um, uh, very similar to Edrioaster Bigsbyot, that's famous from Ontario, Canada. And some of these things are half dollar size. They're very, very large Edrioasteroids. But after years of walking over this particular outcrop, same shale beds, picking up the crinoids, looking at the hard grounds, all this other crap again and again. One day I started noticing there were these unusual fossils. And I finally realized that they were fragments of Brachia spongia. And after all these years of looking, it was just amazing to find these things way down in the Brandon siltstone where they were normally found. This is what the outcrop looked like when it was fairly fresh. You can see fragments of Brachia spongia all over the place. And you see back here is where the crinoids hold fast, and a lot of the crinoids were found right in this particular area here. Uh, this is one of the crinoids that was found in that shale there. This is, I think, the labocrinus. It's, it's a really unusual. But anyway, we sent this off and had it professionally prepared. You see every plate, all the arms and pinules are preserved. So the depositional environment on this had to be something that was very, very rapid sedimentation on top of the hard ground. Hard ground took a long time to form. The rock had to actually lithify from, um, from carbonate mud and carbonate sand. Lithify and be eroded and encrusted with all these things. And sometime after that, a, a storm came along, basically dumped a lot of uh, sediment. And it turns out the crinoids and the brachia sponges both got deposited in a low area between several hard ground layers. So you have little mounds of hard ground and a low area in between. And that's where a lot of the crinoids and brachia sponges ended up. In some cases, the crinoids came out really beautiful like this. And the brachia sponges had a variable fate. You can see some of these are fairly complete. But others are heavily broken up and macerated. All the brachia sponges in the shale layer are very, very heavily um, torn up and transported, even the ones that are in fairly good condition. <coughs> Here's another close-up of some of the excavations we've done. Oh my gosh. So, you know, these are really rare fossils. They're just, you know, wonderful finally finding these after all these years of searching. Here's close-ups of those two fairly decent ones. Well, you want to get this thing going again? Uh, yeah. yeah. Most of the brachia sponges from the shale layer are a little beat up, but they're recognizable. Let's see, I'll show you other slides. I'll have slides of this one again. But you see, they're rather beat up. The edges of the arms are sort of broken off. You can see a little bit of internal mold sticking out of the arms. But they're very, very easily recognizable as being brachia spongia and being um, very similar to the specimens, but they're not heavily solidified. Like these things, even though they're hexactomelic sponges, most of the weave between the, um, between the sponge spicules is, is filled with calcite. So you don't have the heavy silicification. Additionally, specimens like this were probably fairly complete, but you can tell it was transported. It was actually, this specimen was actually buried on one side. This layer here, the lower part of this one, you can see was preserved in limestone. It didn't get crushed very much. But the upper part was preserved in shale. And you see it got squashed. So you have this really weird shape on this one where it should be round, like some of these ones in the picture. Instead, part of it is sort of three-dimensional, and part of it is squashed flat. You'll see a slide of it in a few minutes. I just tip it a little bit. I'm getting dyslexic here with the... Okay. Here's a top view of it. Well, that's all I want to show of that for a few minutes. So we got looking at the outcrop in greater and greater detail, and started looking for more brachia sponges, and sure enough, there were other, there were other layers besides this sort of low area between the two hard ground mounds. We started looking at this particular layer here. It's hard to see anything in the particular slide I have here. But it turns out this is a hard ground surface as well. 
But on this hard ground surface, there's actually specimens preserved in like position. Unfortunately, they were broken in two. You can only see cross-section views of the majority of these. So this particular specimen here, you can see some of the arms sticking out, but it's in white position with the big round chimney on top of the sponge sticking up and the arms sort of being out like a, the claws on a dog or, a, or like the name of the elephant foot sponge, the toes of the elephant being sticking out on this particular specimen. So this one layer had a number of very nice brachia sponges you can see in cross section and in life position. Here's another one, squished a little. This one I thought was a little fascinating, it, it might be sort of turned on one side. So most of these weren't, you weren't able to remove them, just take pictures, that's about it. There's one, you can see sort of the top view, the shale, or the, the silty limestone sort of uh, weathering back, and you can see sort of the top view of the brachia sponge here. And most of those were fairly small, but then we came across yet another layer that had gigantic brachia sponges. This is the specimen I have with me tonight, and you can see this specimen measures all oh, about 20 inches across. It's probably the largest brachia sponge ever discovered. And we had to get it out in pieces. You see the light colored pieces, that was what was sticking out of the outcrop. And we had to take chisels and sledgehammers and get through solid rock and remove a lot of other stuff to get to the fresh stuff over on this end. And you see we glued this back together, it broke considerably. Interesting thing about this specimen is there appears to be another specimen inside of it. You see the, the black or the darker colored material right in this area here at the perculum of the, of the sponge. So these particular ones were probably also living in life position, but got really, really large. And we found a number of these enormous ones. My friend Todd Hendricks has several of them. I have a few in my garage that need gluing back together. And I brought them all. Here's another very large one that's sort of warped to one side. Here's the operculum. Here's the arms. It's interesting. This one, we actually found a trilobite in the very top of the operculum. It was a very, very poorly weathered are broken, it was actually broken in the excavation. Uh, Sororus, sort of a scarce or division trilobite. Here's yet another one I don't have with me. You see this particular specimen, some of the arms are nicely preserved. Here's the top of perculum broken open. And you can see the internal mold sticking out at various places around there. Up close, some of these specimens show mice spicules. You can see this particular specimen shows mice hexactinellid spicules. Hexactinellid sponges are known as glass sponges today. And typical ones today live in very, very deep water, much deeper than the photic zone. I uh, brought in a glass sponge called a genus uh, basket. It's a, one that they dredge, off, dredge up off the Philippines all the time. It's one of the most famous of the modern glass sponges. But these were very shallow. We know from the shallow water, we know from the depositional environment and the other organisms living with them. Here's a specimen I showed you a minute ago that was sort of warped. You see the internal molds of the arms sticking out where some of the arms were broken off. Here's the top view that I tried to show you on the little TV camera. So this part here was preserved in the limestone. This part here was in the shale and got compressed. I was fortunate enough on U.S. place where Carl and Brett does a lot of his work lately um, to find this other specimen of bracken sponge. This is completely an internal mold. And I just included this in this talk because this one shows some unusual features I'll get around to when I get to the uh, paleoecology part of the talk. Oh, well, I guess this should be the uh, I'll go ahead and tell this now. This is an internal mold uh, from USA. But this is an internal mold of Rachiospongia, a very more delicate species, apparently. They got to looking at this in detail. The tips of the arms, this specimen actually has a trilobite that had been living inside of the arm 
attached to the inside of the sponge. And when the sponge weathered away, it left the trilobite behind here. So you can see this little tiny, probably proteus, or one of these really unusual little small word emission um, trilobites here. Additionally, if you get this focused a little bit better, it might be my fault for the slide. 